Adam Grant, really thrilled to have our latest installment in the Authors at Wharton series. Just a couple of reminders before we get started. One is, if you're tweeting, you can use the hashtag WhartonAuthors. Uh, secondly, on Monday, we'll have our last Authors at Wharton for this semester. It's Caddy K on the confidence code about the gap, not in ability, but in self-esteem and judgments of ability between men and women. Uh, but today, we're really delighted to have Stephen Dubner here. Many of you will know him as uh, half of the genius behind Freakonomics, the book, radio show, podcast, movie, and other merchandise still to come. Uh, Stephen's a, a really there brilliant. Used be, there used to be a yo-yo. A yo-yo? There was a yo-yo. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, there was a, like years ago, uh, some yo-yo maker made a Freakonomics yo-yo, which was our favorite ever piece of swag to give away. But we gave them all away. And you didn't so. bring us any. Didn't bring you any. Thank I you. didn't bring you anything. I'm really sorry. I brought nothing. <laughs> well, we, we did bring Stephen. Um, he's a journalist by trade. Uh, he's done just a fantastic job partnering up with Steve Levitt and bringing the very best of behavioral economics and narrative storytelling uh, to all of us to explain the world in ways that we never would have thought possible. And it's a real honor to have him here. Let's give him a warm welcome. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So Stephen, talk to us about how you got into Freakonomics in the first place. Okay. Like, why, like, why are you here? Sure. So, um, hey, do you guys crouching in the stairwell? There's seats like right in front, which would be embarrassing, but it's like an hour. You're going to get sore, so you should just do it. So I'll talk while you're walking down, and nobody will be watching you, OK? So um, I mean, there are one, two, three, four, four blank seats right front. So the bad part is you're going to have to sit right in the front, but at least you can sit. So, um, so Freakonomics started, so, I, um, so I'm a writer, I'm a journalist, um, and you know, I kinda, it took me a while to figure out exactly, I, I always really liked journalism, even as a kid, my dad was, uh, I grew up in upstate New York as the youngest of eight, um, so I just kinda watched what other people did and tried to figure out what I wanted to do, and I wanted to be you know, a shortstop and rock star and all those things that everybody wants to be. Um, but I always really liked journalism, and we had like a family newspaper when I was a kid, staffed just by me and my brothers and sisters. And then, um, but then I, I played music, and um, in college uh, I studied journalism, but I mostly was in a band, started a band, and, and then afterwards we got signed to a, um, a record deal in New York, and that's really what got me to New York City. And, uh, and, I, and we did it, we were like literally on the brink, of, we were making our first record when I decided that the whole idea of wanting to be famous was just so stupid. Because you know, fame from the outside, I think, to most people seems like really great. But what I think is really great about it is the money and the ability to do stuff. But the actual fame part, I think, is hugely costly and terrible. And I came to that realization like right as we were trying to get famous. The irony, now here I am sitting here with all you taking pictures. Um, <laughs> So then, um, so I stopped kind of cold turkey playing music, which I'd been doing for six or seven years, which was my total, total, total life passion. But I'd always been writing. I'd been writing songs, so I'd, I've always written. And then I went to graduate school uh, for, I got a writing degree, then I got in journalism, was working at the New York Times, which was, I loved it, um, dream come true, because the standard was really, really high, still is really high. and. Um, but after a few years there, honestly, the reason I left the New York Times was because you can't, you don't own, you don't build equity in your work. I hate to say it. I was like, a, I was a salaried employee. So you guys are all business school students, right? You're all, everybody's B school or MBA or close to it. So, you know, I mean, I just came to a very basic conclusion, which is I can be a salaried employee forever and make enough to kind of scrape out a living in New York, or I can try to be a little bit entrepreneurial and take the risk, but actually be my brand, be, my, be myself. And so I, I decided I would rather try to write books, so I did that, and I, I'd written a couple books, and I was working on my third, which was about what I thought of then as the psychology of money, which is kind of what we now think of as behavioral economics. So I fell just totally in love with uh, the work of Danny Kahneman and Amos Tversky, which I'm sure most of you or all of you know. Um, and with what Richard Thaler was doing in Chicago to kind of bring it into economics. And I loved that um, economics, which had never really appealed to me that much because the macro stuff just wasn't use useful. Um, it was too mathy for me to be interested in or good at. Um, and it just didn't seem to be, I liked Adam Smith, but I didn't like you know, mid 20th century economics. It was so, for me, not useful. But then what was happening in the behavioral realm fascinated me. It, just, it was just interesting. 
And one thing I've really learned is that you've got to follow what you really love. Because if you're going to be good at something, you're going to have to work really, really, really hard at it. And it's really hard to work really hard at something that you don't love. Some people can force themselves to work 90 hours a week at something that they kind of can tolerate. But you'll be miserable. You really, it's really good to find something you love. And so, um, so I was really into that. I was writing this book about the psychology of money. And then I, my editor at the New York Times uh, asked me if I wanted to write a profile of this guy, Steve Levitt. Who I, I knew a little bit of his research, and I knew it had nothing to do with what I was writing. It, it didn't have anything to do with money. He he doesn't know or care anything about no offense psychology at all. Um, just You've noticed. A, well, <laughs> um, and um, but I read his papers, and uh, and they were just this pile of weird, really good, but really weird papers about collusion among sumo wrestlers and whether the name you give your baby has an impact on the kid's outcome and whether real estate agents are looking out for their client's best interest? Short answer, no. And um, what really appealed to me about him, A, he was really clever, which I like. I like clever. I like funny and fun and clever. But also, um, he was as original in the field of economics as I hoped, tried to be within the field of writing or, or music. Like, I've been thinking about this a lot lately. We've been talking to a bunch of people about making a free economics TV show or something, and this has been going on for years. It is pathetic how few people actually want to be original at anything, because all these TV producers will come in, and they all have this pastiche of, well, we, it'll start out like, you know how the beginning of drunk history, and then it'll be like the Colbert, and then it'll be like this, and like, you guys have, they have, nobody has any idea. It's not that nobody has any ideas. It's just that it's risky to be original. It's, it's a lot easier to do what 100 other people have done and tweak it one degree to the left. But I just get no satisfaction from that personally. So I don't mean to disparage all that. I'm just not into it. So what we've tried to do with Freakonomics is stuff that is interesting to us, is stuff that is empirically real and robust, and, um, and that's it, really. We just do kind of what we want to do. And we've had the good fortune of having an audience like, it's, it's kind of a coincidence, really, that people like to read what we like to write. Because we, we didn't set out to accomplish that. So this is ironic, right? Because you set out to avoid fame, and then right. you end up stuck with it. What has it actually been like? Mm. So I have a really good kind of fame in that I'm not really famous. I'm, I'm a tiny, tiny bit famous. Um, the kind of this is this is honestly this is the biggest reason to not make a TV show because TV makes you really recognizable and I I mean I don't know you know I'm all I'm sure you've all had your experience of being publicly recognized for something even if it's just among a small circle and a little bit of it for a little while is fantastic I've never done crack cocaine I imagine it's like the first little bit of crack cocaine <laughs> but then. Like once you're on your 20th hit of crack cocaine, talk about diminishing returns. It is a bad deal. <laughs> so like right now, honestly, it's really fun. Uh, you know, I live in New York, which is a great city to be pretty anonymous in. Um, uh, I go out, we were out at this place the other day with my kids and a bunch of family friends. And this person came up to me at the table, said, I'm really sorry that it was like brunch on a Sunday. But um, you know, I love the podcast. Could I take a picture? And it was like, if that happens like once a month, that it's totally it's fine. If that were happening, like I know, fa I have I have some friend. I'm friends with friends of really famous people. Their <laughs> lives are. I, I don't want to say it's like a prison. That's ridiculous. But it's a it's very costly. So I would say. You know, there's a huge upside in getting really good and get rich, get powerful. Those things are all fantastic. But fame, <laughs> I think, is to be avoided. Fame, I think, is, is very, very costly Yeah, in ways that almost nobody who sets out to do something that might get them famous really thinks about beforehand. I, you know, when I was at, one of the reasons I stopped playing music was, this is going to sound so name droppy. Bruce Springsteen one day was telling me that, uh, <clears throat> No, but I, I played in this little band. We were kind of like a punky, Rolling Stonesy country hillbilly band in North Carolina. And uh, there was a band that was managed by the same people band that you guys probably never heard of called the Del Fuegos, who were a really good little Boston rock band. And they were, um, they were playing at this club near where we live. So I went to see him. And Bruce Springsteen was in town playing the Coliseum. And he liked the Del Fuegos. And he dropped by 
to hang out with them and to play a couple encores. He, he'd like to do that. He'd go to bars where bands are playing. He'd hang out and play encores. And so I happened to be backstage with them hanging out. And it was me and them and Bruce and um, Niels Lofgren, his guitar player, walk in. So that was awesome. We just got to talk. And he'd never heard of my, he didn't know anything about my band. We, you know, no reason he would have. We didn't have a record out or anything yet. And, uh, and then this was right when he was got, had gotten really big. I guess it was like born in the USA, maybe, record or something. And so we were, I was just asking him, you know, what's it like to go to Japan? And you're playing 80,000 people in Japan. And you go to the hotel there. And he was on the balcony. And people are taking his pictures. And he said, if I knew then what I know now, I don't know if I would have started making records. And I'm sure he didn't fully mean it, because you know he's had about as good a career as you can have. But it dawned on me that there are, there are costs in society that we don't really think about. It's like a lot of stuff that we do in Freakonomics, the upside of quitting. We don't really think about the cost of sticking with something that's you know, not productive or not fun. And so to me, fame is one of those things that's super costly. So let's talk about the upside of quitting. So you, you did something pretty extraordinary uh, that ended up in this book, which is uh, you got people to say, I'm just going to let go of my own decision-making authority, and I'm going <laughs> to let you choose whether I should dump my girlfriend or right. quit my job. <clears throat> uh, talk to us about that. Yeah, did any, does anybody here, did anybody here know, did anybody here do this Freakonomics Experiments website by any Don't chance? Don't do it. No? <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so we, um, We'd done a radio show about the upside of quitting, and then Levitt realized that one of the hard one of the hard parts about measuring whether you should or should not quit is you don't have the data, you don't have the counterfactual. You you can't say you know you can't clone yourself. You can't you know let's say you want to say let's say you want to explore something very basic like uh, high school sports whether it's worth it in the long run or not if you have an academic career um, you know, as, a, as a viable option. So what you'd want to do is you'd want to take a 1,000, let's say, great uh, American high school athlete scholars across the country, randomize them, and force half of them to stop playing sports. And then the other half, they keep playing their sports. And then 5 and 10 and 20 and 30 years later, you measure the outcomes of those two groups in terms of their health, their education, their income, their happiness, and then you, could, then you could have an answer of whether it was on the margin better to quit or not. But you can't do that. You can't do those kind of experiments in society, unfortunately. So, um, <laughs> so Levitt came up with an experiment that could kind of get at it, which was a website where we offered that if you had a hard decision to make about whether to quit something or whether to go into a different field or whether to break up with a girlfriend or boyfriend, that you come to our website. If you're really conflicted, come to our website and we'll flip a coin for you. And then you don't have to obey what the coin says, but a lot of people did. And then we could measure the result. And it turned out, to make a long story short, um, it, it seems to be slightly better on balance to quit something that you're on the fence about than to not quit. Why? Um, we don't really know the why. I, I mean, I have a lot of thoughts about the why. Um, I think probably because if you're even thinking about quitting something, it means that you really, really shouldn't be doing it, but that the reason you haven't quit is because of the sunk cost fallacy. You know, there's sunk cost, we know, but then the sunk cost fallacy is that, oh, because I've spent $100 or 100 hours or 100 brain cells, that it's counterproductive to not spend the 101st which is a fallacy. That's not the right, the right way to think about things generally. Um, I think people generally have a hard time uh, measuring, everybody has a hard time measuring opportunity cost or really measuring what's the, the, the outcome of my opportunity cost. So like when I was playing in the band, like for me, the decision to quit was trying to measure, trying to look at opportunity cost. And basically the thing that tipped me over there was I came from a fam, you know, I mentioned I was the youngest of eight. My dad died when I was a kid. But even with that, family was incredible. It was just like incredibly important to me. Not that I even liked my family that. Honestly, I don't really. They're fine. But, <laughs> but for whatever reason, maybe this was a right decision, wrong decision, a bias or whatnot, I liked the idea of family and being in one. And I liked the idea of having my own at some point. Okay? I didn't know, but when I was in my 20s, 30s, 40s, I wanted to have kids, have a family. I wanted to be a family. 
And I realized when I was like 22 and we were starting to make our first record and I, that if it worked, it would mean it would be really, really, really hard to do that for a long time because you'd be traveling 200 days a year in all kinds of situations that are just not like that family inducive, you know? And so that to me was looking at the opportunity cost and trying to put it in context of how to, how to, how to measure. And that's, um, that's not so easy to do because first of all, human beings are generally terrible at predicting the future, um, even especially with big important things like macroeconomic predictions are terrible, geopolitical predictions are terrible. Just go back and read like, Time or Newsweek from 50 years ago. It is so funny to read what the pundits say is going to happen. It just never, ever, ever comes true. But the weird part is it's really hard even, I mean, you know a lot more about this than I, it's really hard for us as individuals to even predict our own short-term emotional state based on a decision we make. Um, why? It's hard to say. We're humans. We're not perfect. Um, but because you can't predict well how you're going to feel about a certain decision, you often make a decision, uh, you often make a not very good or complete decision. So when psychologists study these dilemmas about quitting, they find that typically sunk costs, opportunity costs, those things matter. But even more important is the ego and image factor yeah. of, you know, I don't want to look in the mirror and admit to other people that I made a stupid decision in the first place. Yeah. So now I'm just going to escalate my commitment and, and try to justify the initial investment. Do you have any favorite ways of overcoming that bias other than just delegating it to Freakonomics authors? <laughs> No, that's a, that's a, it's hard. Um, I mean, when I quit my band, it was brutal for about six or 12 months because it was my whole identity. Like, I lived, I lived at the time in North Carolina, which was not where my family was from. So all my friends, all, you know, all my contacts, all, all my you know, present and past girlfriends, everybody was from this circle that revolved around the band. So it was literally like getting rid of my entire social network. Um, so that was really hard. Uh, I didn't know what I was going to do exactly. Um, and yeah, it felt a little bit like, you know, you feel like a loser for quitting. And people, like, just didn't get it either. It's like, like you know, there were a million bands around, and we actually made it. We got a record contract. And it's just, it just seemed so stupid to quit. Why are you going to quit? And then later when I left the New York Times, even though that to me seemed pretty logical, like, I want to write books. I want to be my own. People at the time didn't really leave the Times that much voluntarily. Um, so I can't say that I learned any guy, like, good strategy for not feeling like a loser. Um, because you, you, people do look at you that way. And also, there are practical downsides of it. Like, when I was at the Times, I could be working on a project of my own. I could be working on a book of my own and call up someone to want to do some reporting or research, say, hey, my name is Stephen Dubner. I write for the New York Times. I'm working on a book. I wonder if you can help me. They always would return your call. Then the next day, I was, hi, my name is Stephen Dubner. I'm working on a book about the Pittsburgh Steelers, da 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 or whatever it was at the time. And I'm wondering, and like that call wouldn't get returned. So there are real costs to every decision you make. But on balance, um, for me, it turned out to, to be a much better one. In terms of like. Um, not looking, you know, what you're asking about is a little bit different of, it's admitting that you may have made a mistake. You know, I guess I would argue, it's not that it was a mistake to pursue a path, it was an experiment. That's what you could say. It's like, I'm a big believer in experimentation and think that most people just don't do it enough in life generally, and especially in the corporate world, they're really scared of experiments. And you look, you can say, you know, this job I took, this master's program I enrolled in, this relationship I was in, it was an experiment. There was no way to know whether it was going to work unless I tried it. And unfortunately, it was an N of 1, and it's a time series of 1, and there was no way to really, truly experiment. The only, exper the only way to experiment was to do it, and it was a failed experiment. And you know, if you want to think I'm a loser, then you know, Galileo was a loser, and Einstein was a loser, and so on, because they all did a lot of experimentation. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so one of my favorite parts of the book is uh, when you talk about the three hardest words in the English language, which I think are especially important for this audience of, of mostly Wharton undergrads and MBAs. Yeah, so the three hardest words we argue are I don't know, to just admit that you don't know the answer to a question or the, the, more broadly the solution to a problem. I, I mean, the problem is, you know, I'm talking to exactly the wrong crowd here, because what you learn here is to fake it in every situation. <laughs> I mean, I say that with great 
appreciation in that, you know, like, you know, probably half of you are going to be consultants at some point in the near future, if not in the distant future. And basically what a consultant does is goes into a business and an industry that two minutes ago you knew nothing about, and there are people sitting around you who've been working in it 5, 10, 30 years, and they're looking at you saying, you know, what do we do? We're getting clobbered. What do we merge? What do we get rid of? Who do we fire? Who do we hire? What do we price it? What's our product? And like, you're the person they're looking to for the answer. So are you going to say, well, you know, that's a really hard question. And uh, it's going to take me a long time. And I'm going to have to gather a lot of data. And if I get lucky, I'll have a little bit of an answer to a shard of that question. No, <laughs> you're not going to say that. You're going to say, oh, yeah, you should close down Singapore and Manila and Brazil, and you should um, probably hire my friends to come in and restaff it. So, um, so it is a problem, especially in the business sphere where the time frame is really short. It's a big problem in the political sphere too. But what we argue is that to, to reach, so, so it can often be strategic to BS, right? We know that. But if, you, if your primary concern is being good or being right, or being profitable in the long run. When I say profitable, I mean either financially for a firm or profitable socially. If you really care about that part, and I'm not saying you should, but if you do, then it's really good to the minute you walk up to a problem to acknowledge what you don't know rather than, than pretending you do. And acknowledging how little you do know will greatly change and shape the, method, the methodology you approach to find out the rest of it. You know, I, I shouldn't say ironically. Ironically, to most people, one of the institutions that's really good at, at doing this is the US military. Um, you know, they're dealing with a lot of, there's a lot of strategy and a lot of kind of philosophy within the military, but there's also a lot of logistics and real answers and engineering. It's not like you can fake it. If you say, like, you know, I think we should build this bridge from here to here with so and so, with such and such firm at such and such duration you're going to find out whether or not you're right. There's a good feedback loop. It's a little bit different than a lot of other firms. But the military is really, really, really good. And this comes from the top, and it's got to. But the military is really good at allowing people all the way down the chain to basically say, you know, the, it's different in every branch, but a common answer is, I don't know, sir, but I will find out and report back to you soon, sir. That's like, you know, kind of almost a mantra that they're taught to say. And I think, man, if even a little bit of that could be imported into the corporate sphere, but especially in the political sphere, it's so painful. Like, you guys, as you get out in the world and you know, when, once you start to know a lot about some piece of industry, whatever your industry ends up being, the minute you hear a politician talk about something that you actually know about, you're going to cringe because it's so obvious that they have no idea what they're talking about. And yet they kind of feel like they have to, they have to do it. And so um, the more that you can stop faking and actually get on the road to finding out real stuff, the better. There's a cool piece of evidence on that. So Zach Tormala at Stanford has these studies showing that when experts say they don't know, people actually listen to them more because they think that an expert will know. And it surprises them. They actually pay attention and listen to the argument, which is usually convincing. But you point out that there's a side benefit of saying, I don't know, which is occasionally you can then get away with BSing more effectively. Right. If you're the person who, like, in the meeting, let's say you're the brand new consultant, and they're going around the table, and they're, and they're saying, this is the problem. You know, what do you think will fix it? And let's say you decide to say, you know, I don't know. Uh, obviously, it's a hard problem, or you wouldn't be asking me. So why would you expect me to know? Let's let's pretend that you had <laughs> the stupidity to do that, right? The next time that you do BS, they're all going to believe you, because you'll be the person who said I don't know the first time around. So you'll gain huge strategic ammunition, so that when you do BS the next time. They're going to believe you, which could work out well, could work out very poorly, depending on what your advice is. <laughs> so I, I have to say, there, this is probably revealing my bias as a psychologist. But um, I was intrigued that, that the two of you wrote about this I don't know idea. Because if you were to poll a group of academics, economists would probably be rated oh, the as worst. the most arrogant. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and so how, how do you arrive at this writing with an economist, of all yeah. people? So I would argue it's because Levitt is uh, not a typical economist. I think that uh, you know he, he is, um, he's as arrogant as most economists in a lot of ways, but he's also really um, 
you know, I mean, we've worked together a lot in a lot of different circumstances, and uh, it's remarkable. You know, he's the big deal University of Chicago, John Bates Clark Medal winning economist who also, you know, wrote these books. And we'll go in to meet with some big firm or a government official or something like that. And he's really good at just saying, you know, th th they'll immediately turn to, to us, mostly to him. And say, you know, uh, here's here's my, you know, David Cameron wants us to fix his budget problems, and you know, they'll, they'll ask us these questions, and he's really good at saying, like, you know, I have no idea how government actually works, or I have no idea how business actually works, but um, so why don't you tell me, like, what do you actually make, and what's it cost you to make, and how do you decide to set the price? And it's remarkable if you ask uh, those baseline questions to people who really know what they're talking about, they're super into it, because they've been thinking about it, they've been obsessed with this all their lives. I find that with academics, too. The better an academic is, when you ask them a really straightforward, simple question, the better they are at explaining it. It's the ones who obfuscate and, and talk to you in jargon who I've come to the conclusion they're not really that good. They don't really, or they maybe don't have that much to, to say to you. So um, I think there's a huge value in just being totally transparent about how little you may know about their problem, but also just show your sincerity, show your true desire to know. Um, most people are so flattered to be asked a, a legitimate question about what they do, because no one cares about anything that you do, really. You know, no one in your work, unless you owe them a report and you haven't done it. So um, <laughs> people are real. People love to talk about what they. do how they found out what they found out, um, how, why they think they're right, what the evidence is. Um, so yeah, and, and Levitt is really good. So in some ways, like I said, he's all economists are pretty arrogant. They're easily the most triumphal of the social scientists, without question. Maybe not triumphal is not the right word. Uh, colonial is sick, right? <laughs> they, 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 economists encroach on every, you can't name an academic discipline that are, there aren't economists working in. They're in criminology, they're in healthcare, they're in educate, they're in everywhere. Psychologists don't necessarily do all that although more and more. Um, so they are super, super arrogant, but the good ones are also smart enough to know that the best way to get some good information is to not come in like you're the big dog um, and know all the answers. So I guess this fall between you and Peter Thiel, consulting is getting a little bit of a bad rap. Oh, but, is he? Uh, yeah. <laughs> but there's, uh, there's an, a point in the book where you actually suggest a really exciting opportunity for a consulting business. And it starts with uh, the idea that, in fact, the scam emails we all get from Nigeria deliberately mention Nigeria. Right. I thought that was fascinating. Could you talk to us about that a little bit? Yeah. So um, this is part of a chapter that was basically about building good traps um, and trying to, um, when, when you have a lot of data or a lot of people that you need to sort and you need to account for adverse selection, you need to account for false positives, you also need to account for false negatives. You know, how do you do it? And basically, this was a great research paper written by a guy named Cormac Hurley, who's a uh, really lovely guy and really good. Uh, he's basically a, an anti-fraud scientist at Microsoft. And he wrote a paper basically asking why, if everyone knows that uh, Nigerian email scams are scams, why do the guys writing them say they're from Nigeria? Why don't they change and make it, this is the um, you know, Indonesian transport company scam or the whatever. Why do they keep saying they're from Nigeria? And his conclusion was that it's intentional, theoretically at least, because what he's wanting to, what, what they want to do is get their potential audience to sort themselves. Because if the emails are a little bit more plausible, i.e. a little bit less stupid, they will sort um, not well enough. And there will be too many people who are smart enough that by the time it's time to actually give the scammers money, they will have wised up to the fact that it's a scam. So what you're actually trying to do is recruit the dumbest people you can find. <laughs> I shouldn't say the dumbest, the most gullible, the most suggestible, the ones who don't know that an email that says I'm a contractor with the Nigerian government and I happen to have $50 million, I don't know what to do with it, do you want some, that they're going <laughs> to respond to it.
So I don't know what the consulting business is. Is, is, is well, that you're, you're, one of your suggestions anyway was that you could actually build a, a sort of a, a counter surgency program oh. that would maybe make it harder for these scammers to fool the gullible people. That's right. Uh, so Cormac Hurley, because he's you know a technologist essentially, his solution was to build a good bot that could a chat bot that could engage scammers realistically enough to engage so much of their time that it would make their relatively slim false positive hits still incredibly punitive to them by basically tying them up with a chat bot so that it would be so hard to get the, the real suckers, the real victims, that it wouldn't be profitable anymore. Great fun. Um, another, uh, another thing that I thought was interesting sort of building on that was uh, the, the trap that you laid uh, with Super Freakonomics to catch terrorists. Yeah, so in Super Freakonomics, we uh, told a story about um, building an algorithm in conjunction with a British bank. With really, it was one. It was really one really hardworking creative guy in a uh, in a fraud unit at a big British bank. And Levitt worked with him for years and years, and I helped a tiny bit, but that's this is not my thing. Um, but I sat and watched a lot, and uh, and so basically the idea was. Could we, by using uh, retail banking data and sifting for a, a variety of behavioral metrics, identify people from out of those millions and millions and millions of bank customers, people who might be involved in or potentially be involved in terrorist activities? And so we came up with um, a series of uh, a b kind of basket of metrics that seemed to do a pretty good job of identifying people who were potentially terrorists or who like to hang out with other people who were potentially terrorists. And uh, one of these metrics that we identified as being very fruitful in the algorithm had to do with life insurance. So banks sell life insurance. Almost no one buys it from their banks, but they do sell it. Um, but we made the argument in Super Freakonomics that um, one of the good metrics, um, one, one of the good indicators that someone might be a terrorist is that they don't buy life insurance from their bank. Because if you're a young guy who might blow up a train station uh, at some point in the near future, even if you have a wife and kids, you're probably not going to buy life insurance because it probably won't pay out if it's in the, your death is in the commission of a crime. That was, that was what we said. So, so basically, implicit in that was if you want to throw this algorithm off your trail, you should buy life insurance. In fact, in the subtitle of the book, it was Global Cooling, Patriotic Prostitutes, and Why Suicide Bombers Should buy life insurance. So we were as explicit as we could. So <laughs> when we went to Britain uh, on book tour for Super Freak, the press there just hated us so much. <laughs> they said, why would you idiots go to the trouble to create an algorithm to track down terrorists and then tell the bad guys how to evade it? It is so stupid. And so we just sit there, oh, yeah, that was stupid. Why didn't we think of that? <laughs> so. <clears throat> But the idea was, by the time we were doing promotion for that book, the algorithm was in place. The bank was using it. And it was looking at you know, these billions of pieces of data every day, really. And it was, keeping, it was paying attention to what people were doing now. So who now had an incentive to run out and buy life insurance from their bank? Only the people who were feeling like they didn't want our algorithm to touch them in the data. So basically, we tried, and I think succeeded. We don't really know, because then we turned our stuff over to intelligence, and they're not going to tell us anything. But we think we succeeded in making the, what had been a pretty tight net a little bit tighter by basically encouraging the bad guys to identify themselves by doing the very thing that we told them would be good for them, which was, in fact, bad for them. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you also add that not many people buy life insurance from their bank to begin with. I mean, that was the beauty of it. So this we didn't say, because this would have thrown it off. Um, what we didn't say is that something fewer, like, I can't remember the number now, I think fewer than half of 1% of people in the UK who have life insurance buy it from their bank. Nobody buys life insurance from their bank. They sell it, but nobody buys it from there. They get it from a broker or whatnot. And so if we had said that, that would have been a problem, because the potential terrorist would have said, oh, meaning that if I go buy it, I'll be that tiny bit, and it'll be really easy to spot me. But they were thinking, who knows what they were thinking? They were thinking, oh, that's what you do. You go buy life insurance. So yeah, but, but that's why it worked. If it weren't that way, it wouldn't have worked for our purposes if everybody bought it. 
So there, there are a lot of other surprising and interesting anecdotes as usual. Um, you ask whether expensive wines actually taste better. Not good news, by the way, for those of you who like it's expensive wines. Great news wine. for those of you who don't want to blow a lot of money. I'm, I'm guessing there are many more of you who like wine a little bit, or at least think you like wine, have been persuaded that you like wine because it's a, a good thing to like, but you hate spending like 50 or 80 or $100 a bottle. It's actually great news because like the average $12 bottle of wine, even to experts, tastes about as good as the average $80 bottle of wine. That's the short answer. So I, I would argue it's good news. I think it's mostly good news. I think there are a few wine experts who are going to be really devastated. Really bad news for them. Yeah. So be it. Uh, I also uh, really enjoyed the discussion of Smile Train and oh, the way yeah. that they get donations. Uh, can you tell us about that a little bit? Yeah, so I, I love this story too. Um, so Smile Train is a, uh, a philanthropy that raises a bunch of money and then distributes the money around the world to hospitals and doctors to perform cleft palate and cleft lip, lip surgeries on kids who otherwise couldn't afford it. And it's this incredibly simple surgery. It's very cheap. Uh, and the way that Smile Train got to this business model was a story in itself, which we tell in the book, which was good. But then the, the, the later part of the story that we tell in the book is about how they raised money. And this was so cool. Um, basically, the guy who was running Smile Train, he's no longer there. Um, he's running a different project now called, I think, Wonder Work, which is basically, he felt like they kind of solved the cleft issue. And he moved on to other childhood diseases around the world, about uh, five of them. And he's raising money to, to attack those. But what they did was, it was a fundraising idea. And it was basically saying that um, when we tell people that we want them to send us money so that we'll go do good work in the world, uh, a lot of people give money. And Smile Train was phenomenal at raising money. Over the course of 20 years, I think they raised close to a billion dollars. So they were really, really good. But Brian Mullaney, this guy, thought they could be even better. Why not? And he realized that there's a certain part of the population that doesn't get involved in that kind of charity, even if they want to, because they don't want to be harassed over and over again but to give more money, to get more involved, and maybe have their names sold and get on other lists. They don't want it. It's a hassle. And in fact, Smile Train, if you give like $20 to Smile Train and you're on their list now, they will send you an average of about 18 communications a year telling you about their work and so on. So Brian Mullaney thought, I think that even though we're raising a lot of money, I think there are a lot of people out there who like our work, would like to contribute, but they don't want to get involved in this relationship with us. It's like we're asking them to marry us, and they just want like a one-night stand. Maybe we should give them a one-night stand. So he came up with this idea that was called once and done donation. That is, he offered an option. He wanted to offer an option where he would write to people and say, if you give us money once, and if you tell us you never want to hear from us again, we'll never write to you again. So this idea, you have to understand, I don't know how much you know about philanthropy and fundraising, but within that world, this is considered totally heretical because it's very expensive to acquire a new donor, just as it is in business, very expensive to acquire a new customer. If you're selling um, uh, razor blades, right, and you know where you capture your uh, customers, and you know that you know boys and girls start shaving, you know that if you can get them there, which, where it's very expensive to do so, you'll probably have those customers for a long time. And it's that way in a lot of industries. With donations, with philanthropy, it's that time many times over. It's expensive to acquire, but then you can milk these people forever. So the last thing in the world you'd want to do is to say to somebody, we want you to give us money, and then we are going to forego the right to shake you down forever. And everybody at his firm and everybody else in that field said, don't do this. It's bad. First of all, it won't work. It'll be bad for everybody. But you know, he said, screw that. I'm going I'm to do it, and, uh, which is maybe one of the reasons why he's not at Smile Train anymore. But, <laughs> ac but actually, no, because it actually worked. So what happened is when they sent out a letter, and they, they, um, they do a lot of experimentation at Smile Train with direct mail. Direct mail is great for real randomized experimentation. You can write essentially the same letter, but then customize it in four or 10 different ways, send out all these different uh, letters to different equivalent groups, and see what works best. And he found that what happened, the once and done offer turned out to be great. It turns out that they had the highest response rate ever. It was more than double the typical um, response rate. So in fundraising, to go from like 1% to 2% would be huge. They also gave a little bit more money on average than the typical donor. But moreover, 
the vast majority of people who got the offer to be once and done didn't even opt out of the communications. In other words, the majority of people who finally gave the smile train only because they were promised that smile train would no longer bother them didn't want to not be bothered by smile train and they ended up being the better donors. And so we, we, we tried to figure out again the why. I mean, you asked the why before. Often the why is the really, the impossible part. We, we often don't really know. But you know, we tried to explain. I think there are a few reasons why this may have worked so well. The candor, you know, when's the last time you had a firm come to you and say, we know that you don't like hearing from us, you know? The novelty, this has never been done before, but I think the biggest, what we think is the biggest thing is what that letter did or what that uh, mechanism did is it changed the framework of the relationship between the firm and the person. Whether it's for-profit or non-profit doesn't matter. Pretend it's for-profit. It's a for-profit company. You've got the firm and the customer. And the customer thinks of, the firms think of the customers as basically a flock of human wallets from which they want to extract as much money, right? And the customers think of the firms as a bunch of faceless pirate capitalists who are just trying to get as much as they can from me, but I kind of want their stuff, so I have to give them something. It's not what you'd call like a nice symbiotic relationship, usually. That changes. Apple seems to have persuaded a lot of people that that's the way they are, but most firms aren't like that. It's a purely financial fr uh, framework. Smile Train had a similar thing. Even though they're a charity, they were saying to people, give us your money, we'll do good stuff with it, and you'll feel a little bit better about it. But rather than do that, they were now saying, look, give us your money. You want us to do what we're going to do. We want to do what we're going to do. But we also understand that it's a hassle for us to keep hassling you. And really, rather than us being the, the customer and you being the client or the, the, the customer, uh, rather than us being the firm and you being the customer, why don't we be collaborative here? And why don't we set it up as a collaborative framework so you can be done with it? And I think just allowing, in this case, the customer to have the ability to back out just changed the relationship of how those people felt about Smile Train. And man, I think if for-profit firms can do this in a way that's not exploitive but legitimate, there's huge upside in making people who buy stuff from you feel that you really do represent them in some way. It's hugely valuable. So this is a cool example of something you do many times, which is you find a, just an unbelievably surprising story, and then you bring it to life with some data. Um, we have a lot of people in the room who are interested in becoming better storytellers, either because they're pitching startups, yeah. or they realize that this is how they sell a consulting business, or anything else they're trying to get across to other people. Where do you find these stories, and then what advice would you give about how to tell them better? So there's, there's no mystery to find stories, just, you know, be inquisitive and, you know, I fly on planes a lot and, I, uh, you know, I literally, I just got in this habit of like, I actually, now I hate talking to people on planes. When I first started flying a lot, I thought it was fun, but then you get locked into that three hour conversation. Um, <laughs> but um, I really, really, really like uh, when I meet someone, anyone, um, no matter what they do, um, I just basically say, oh, you know, tell me something I don't know about that, the thing that you do. And it's just, it's a really fun conversation. And that's honestly, that's the way you find stories is by talking to a lot of people. Um, you know, one lesson I learned um, in the Talmud, this uh, wonderful, bizarre piece of Jewish uh, rabbinic literature, there are many lessons along the lines of, you know, who is wise? Who is the wise person? The wise person is he who learns from everyone, including those who come and sit at the dust at his feet. In other words, it's a real mistake to just seek out people that you think are the super smart people. It's a really, it's a huge mistake to do that, I think. So I really think it's a great idea to learn anything you can from anyone. That said, nine out of 10 stories I start to pursue turn out to be not interesting, not true, no data, whatever. So, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of false hunting. In terms of the stories that you tell, in terms of becoming a better storyteller, I mean, we actually, there's a chapter in the book that apparently you all got for free that's about um, kind of how, how to tell. How, uh, that's fine with me. I'm not paying for it. That's great. Um, <laughs> but there is a chapter called something like Why You Should Tell Stories. I don't, I don't even remember the name of the chapter. But it, it talks about the, the kind of argumentative uh, validity of storytelling and how it works on the human brain. And then it gives some strategy for telling good stories. I don't know if, I don't remember if this is included in the chapter, but as a writer, 
the thing that was most instructive for me, I think most people, in whether you're in business or music or writing, you think, oh, I'm going to look at the geniuses, and I'm going to emulate them. And I think that's a crazy model. Because as much as I think it's great to be original, the fact that someone who was very original became very successful is, to me, an indicator that they did something that you are not going to be able to do, that they had a different set of thoughts or ideas or desires or whatnot. And so I see that a, a very common mode is for people to try to copy successful ideas and people. I personally don't think that's such a great idea um, for all kinds of reasons. Um, you know, Peter Thiel likes to talk about you know, the value of monopolies, but it's only the monopoly when you get there first and you can, you know, you're, you're there and you can, you, can, you can exploit that. I argue that it's a lot more valuable to learn from people who really suck. And I learned this in graduate school when I studied writing at Columbia in the MFA program. When some, you know, let's say we're bringing in some piece of writing to discuss, Chekhov, Tolstoy, Virginia Woolf, whatever. And basically what would happen is everybody would read it and say, oh man, that's brilliant, right? So first of all, two things struck me. One is, if you brought in that same piece of writing and said it was by you, Nobody would say it's brilliant. She would say, oh my God, these sentences are like so disconnected. Virginia Woolf, you know, Adam Grant slash Virginia Woolf, she is nuts. She has no idea what she's doing. These, you know, I would not believe that story for one minute. But now that it's been given the imprimatur of literature, everybody acknowledges that it's brilliant and they want to look for ways to kind of clone that brilliance. And that's really hard for all the reasons I just said. However, if you then read the writing of your peers, who are just like you, and you read something that they've written, and this could be short stories like I was studying or business plans like you're studying, and you see the things that are egregiously stupid, I feel that is a great way to learn. It's a lot easier, I think, to learn from mistakes because it's a lot easier to actively stop doing stupid things than it is to copy brilliance. You may or may not be brilliant, but I don't think you're going to be brilliant by copying someone else's brilliance. However, under the uh, slight chance that you personally are not brilliant, you can at least get a lot better by not doing the stupid stuff that everybody else is doing. So I say learn from the bad mistakes that um, everyone around you is making. I think that's great advice. Um, so one of the ways that uh, folks here at Wharton are trying to eliminate mistakes is uh, we have this People Analytics Conference. Uh, the second installment will be in April. We bring together um, HR leaders and basically talent management folks from major companies and try to get them to be more evidence-based and data-driven. And I'm curious, from all the work that you've done, what you would say to those people when you think about being somebody who's responsible for people and talent and making their decisions more data-driven. Anything you would do differently if you were in charge of HR? You know, I, I don't know. I think it's a, good, it's a good hard problem to solve. And obviously, there's a lot of upside, too. I've been talking to some people who do this work, who, who kind of who sell products to do this. And I'm not really persuaded that it's that valuable yet. Um, I think it, a little bit of a little bit of it is the observer dilemma. You know, if people know, like I've been reading a lot about these, you know, pop surveys that firms give their employees and so on. Like, you know, if there's anything that I care even a little bit about being judged on, you, you know, I think first of all, anonymity is hugely, hugely, hugely important. So a lot of the measurement that's being done, I mean, I think the the expectation of privacy even within a firm now is close to zero, as it should be. You know, if I come work in a firm, I'm working on on your computer. I'd have to be pretty stupid by this point to not think that every email is susceptible to you thinking about it in some way, whether it's analyzing it, reading it, whatever. So um, therefore, then you're going to be dealing with a lot of polluted data and that you're only seeing the stuff that people want you to see on some level. So I think that um, using, I think that it's hard to use data well to plumb the depths of employees' truest abilities and intentions and so on. That said, there, there are a lot of ways you can't, like, you know, one example we write about that I like is using um, anonymous internal prediction markets in a firm to set that up, to set up a prediction market that are anonymous where there are some stakes where you can actually get a better feel for what the people who are closest to a project think will actually happen to that project. As opposed to, you know, if you're the boss and you call a meeting with seven team leaders and say, you know, here's a big project that's supposed to launch on day X. Give me your degree of confidence that it will launch on day X. There's nobody in their right mind who's going to come in there and tell you that it won't. 
But if you could survey anonymously the 1,000 people who are actually working on that, is this going to happen on day X? You're going to get a different set of data. So I think any time you can get good, candid data, but you know something I've written about a few times, self-declared survey data, self-declared data, is just bad, potentially bad, in so many different directions that I think you have to be really careful of it. And I'm afraid that a lot of the HR initiatives I've seen are either they're so transparent that everybody will be just putting their best foot forward, or they're based on survey data that is just not going to be very. Because the difference between declared preferences and revealed preferences is just too vast to be useful. You got to find the data that represents the revealed preference, not the declared. Yeah, I'm hoping that we're going to see most of this field move in the direction of field experiments, yeah, where yeah. you know different units, different groups of employees are going to get randomly assigned to different treatments, and then we're going to learn about what works. I'm all for that, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so if you were going to do that on a larger scale, let's say you were president of the United States, um, this is always a fun question. Uh, last year, Malcolm Gladwell said that he would divide the US into four categories and sell Texas if anyone would buy it. <laughs> uh, the question is, what would you do first? If you were what would president? I do first if, oh, oh not related to the, uh, no, just more uh, broadly. Yeah, you can do anything. Leader of the free world. Are we are we country. streaming here? Yes. Uh, I can't say what I would do first then. Um, <laughs> um, it's password protected for now. No. <laughs> I've learned the hard way. Um, <clears throat> um, I have no idea. Um, I have no idea what I would do first, or, or even tenth, for that matter. So, so I get, So since I don't have at all an answer to that, I'll tell you where my brain is going. Um, my brain is going to this um, this idea that I've written about and done radio about a few times, which is uh, about the headline of this thing. Every time I kind of refresh it, is how much power does the president of the United States really have? Um, and my answer to that, and this is a hard empirical question, hard question to answer empirically, but we try. And then there's a lot of other ways to answer it. And my answer is much, 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 much less than people think he or she has. Okay? So I think the first thing that I might do if I were president is I would get on TV. I mean, okay, I'd get on TV and say, uh, thank you for electing me. Uh, that was really nice of you. Um, <laughs> And I, but I got to tell you something. Um, I got to tell you that roughly 48% of you didn't elect me, um, and 52% of you, let's say, um, did. But let me talk about that for a minute. What it really means, what it really means is that 52% of you just kind of thought that you sort of like me a little bit, or at least a little bit better than the other guy. And it means that 48% of you like the other guy or woman a little bit better than me. That's really all it means. I hate to say that because we like to think that our political system is so sophisticated and that it represents all these fantastic ideas and theories, but it's really, it doesn't work. If you look at the evidence, it doesn't work that way. So I want to be grateful, but I also want to acknowledge that I didn't get elected because I'm necessarily so good at anything. I got elected because we have a system that puts two people up, and I was the one who didn't lose, OK? Now, now that I'm here, what do I do? Here's the first thing I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you that most of what I do doesn't matter very much. <laughs> I'm serious. And this is really important, because throughout history, there's been this human appetite to have someone fix our problems. Um, I would say I'm a, I, I'm a fairly religious person myself. I may not be whatever. I don't, we don't have to get into that specifically. But um, So I understand the impulse to look to God or a deity of some kind to solve problems or to intervene. Um, I'm a child of parents. I know that when I'm a little kid, I look to my parents to solve problems. Uh, I, know, I know the great man theory of history promoted by Thomas Carlyle and other dour Scottish philosophers who believed that history was just this big, messy, muddy riverbed that every once in a while some great man, never a woman according to Carlyle, but a great man would pop up and suddenly exert his greatness on the rest of us and the world would get a little bit better. I know all of that and I don't believe that's true. I believe that, uh, that uh, for most of us, 
we belong to this system that's got a little bit of democracy and a little bit of capitalism and a little bit of altruism and a little bit of friendship and a little bit of social interaction and a little bit of law and order. And we've kind of struggled for many thousands of years to get it a little bit better. But the idea that there's one person sitting at the top of this pyramid, me, who happens to be here only because you like me a little bit more than the other guy, can pull all these strings and make jobs and make you happy, that's a fantasy. That's a fiction. I am better than the Wizard of Oz, but only marginally, because I have a bigger <laughs> staff, okay? And so what I would really encourage people to do in my first day is to not look afar at some big authority, um, not look afar at some big authority as a source of good or bad. The government can't fix all your problems, but the government can't, isn't going to create all your problems either. But I would encourage people to have faith and have trust in the series of interlocking systems that we've built up over thousands of years as humans, humans are an awesome animal. We're an awesome species. We've learned generally how to not kill each other so much, how to get sick from things that used to kill us, how to make enough food to feed most people when there aren't stupid despots and dictators standing in the way to, feed, to steal the food. We've, learned, we've gotten so much better at so, 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 so many things. So why don't we just kind of keep trying to do that rather than pretending that we need some magician to come in and fix all the problems. So I'm happy that you put me here, and I'll do my best to help in this big, messy cause. It will be very imperfect, um, but uh, I'll, I'll see you four years from now. That's what I'd say. You don't really plan on running for re-election, do you? <laughs> <laughs> Zero chance of getting reelected. Zero chance of getting elected in the first place, but uh, yeah. But yeah. I would admire it nonetheless. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so let's, let's open it up for some questions from the audience. We'll have microphones coming around. If you want one, raise your hand and it will move toward you. Mm. We have one down here. Hi. Uh, first of all, thanks for being here. Um, so I, I have a question for you about your partnership with your other author. Uh, it, it always strikes me as a kind of funny relationship uh, in listening to the podcast where it feels like you're having a growing passion in economics, but you came from very different roots. And Levitt you know, it also comes from a very different trajectory. So just wondering you know, how the two of you collaborate and, and also how long you see this collaboration lasting. Yeah. So um, I would say um, the short answer is uh, it's a really good collaboration in part because we both really believe in complementarities. In other words, he really believes there are parts of it that I do well and I, there are parts of it that I believe he really does really, really well. And, and our division of labor is pretty um, severe. That said, I probably do more research than uh, some collaborators might do in this kind of thing. And he does a lot more storytelling. I mean, he's a really, Levitt's a really good He's really good at you know, telling, telling how something happened. Even you know, if you read his academic papers, they're not meant to be stories. But he's a great explainer. He's a really good communicator and explainer. Um, in terms of you know, the podcast, is, uh, I, I wouldn't call it a fictional uh, um, representation, but we, we, let, I try, we try to give the, no, I shouldn't even say we try. It gives the appearance that he's a lot more involved than he actually is. So basically, when I first came up with the idea for the radio show, for the podcast, Lev, it was like, that is the biggest, stupidest, baddest idea. It will waste all your time. Why on earth would you want to do that? And I said, uh, you know, it, it just seems kind of fun, fun way to tell stories. And he said, well, if you want to do it, I'll, I'll, do it. I'll do it when you want, but, you know, as long as it's not too often. So basically what happens now is, you know, I do the podcast, and I have a staff of producers at WNYC, but Levitt basically... I call him up for basically 45 minutes once a month, and then we do him on the topics. But the way it works, because he's so good, we end up using all of his tape. Because most people we interview for 45 minutes and use three minutes. But Levitt's really good, and he really knows what he's doing with this. So we can take that 45 minutes and put like you know four minutes in 10 different episodes. It sounds like Levitt's in the radio studio all night, <laughs> staying up, working on the podcast, <laughs> which I think is kind of great. Um, so that's the way that part of it works. In terms of the books, it's really different. Um, in terms of how long it's going to go on, we're right now um, putting together a book that will be out in May, I think, which is uh, a book. It's a, uh, um, 
what's the word? I can't think of the word. A compendium, a, an anthology. It's a collection of writing from uh, our blog, our website for the past 10 years. So we never wanted to do this. People had asked for a while, and it just seemed like such a stupid idea. And then um, I'll tell you when it, it started to seem less stupid to me was um, last summer, one of my kids was going to camp in Maine. And uh, he was at a camp in, uh, the town was Poland, Maine. So you know what they make in Poland, Maine? Yeah, Poland spring water. You drive right by Poland spring, which is a spring, I guess. I don't know. And uh, there's a factory, and there's a sign for it. And, um, and I thought, man, I've always been fascinated by water economics and what behavior around water generally and the cost of water, how it's not priced into so much and so on. I thought, you know, Poland Spring and Evian and all these other people, they took something that had been freely available to everyone and free to everyone, and they just started bottling it and selling it. And that's, that's a lot like our blog. Like, anybody <laughs> who ever wanted to could go and read as much as they want forever, but you know, if we put it in a bottle and ship it to you, maybe it's worth it. So that was the point at which I stopped arguing. <laughs> that was the point at which I stopped arguing with our agent and the publishers who wanted it. And then we said, you know, if, if we have 10 years of writing, if we throw away the worst 98% and go, do the good 2%, it'll be like Michelangelo always talked about sculpture. It's easy. Just cut away all the parts you don't want from the block of stone. So that's what we're trying to do for this. So, so again, that's mostly me. You know, We've already written all this stuff. That's me compiling it and editing it. And then we have two other books that are kind of on burners, but it's hard to say um, whether they're going to work out or not, because we have a pretty high threshold for not wanting to stink. I mean. We may stink, but it's not for lack of effort. And it's not, we're never going to consciously stink. So we're always going to want to believe that w the project we're working on, we're, we're going to want to believe that the, whatever we write is really good, or at least try to be really good. And if we feel these next two books could be really good, we'll keep going. And if not, then we'll stop. So thanks. Hi, I'm up here in this corner. <laughs> um, I, hello. I know a while back you guys on the website uh, kind of did some interactive stuff. You guys had a commitment device with the coin, and you asked you were collecting data on people who were willing to give it. Are you guys ever thinking about doing that again or anything similar? So that uh, that free economics experiment site is still uh, it's still kind of active, but not really. So bottom, uh, short answer is not really. Um, what happened? You know, we both got. Dis I don't know about distracted. We both kind of we both get bored pretty easily. And the website, you know, when we started our website and our blog, it was ten years ago. And a blog then, even though blogs weren't new, a blog was like a really fun thing to have. Um, and the and you know the world has changed like eight times over since then. And a blog isn't that much fun to have. A blog. Most people who go to blogs now are really demented in some way. Um, <laughs> Because it's so much easier to consume. I, and I count myself among them. There are like five blogs that I still go to because I want to read them on their site. And I really want to look at the comments and do all that. But the, the distributive mechanisms change so many times over since then that a blog just feels very much like a horse and buggy in certain ways. Additionally, <clears throat> Levitt does a lot of consulting. Levitt does a lot of golfing. I do a lot of radio. I do some golfing too, not as good as Levitt. So like radio is really time consuming for me. So the blog just became the thing that we're not doing that much anymore. But if we have an idea that we need to use uh, that kind of forum for to, to find people or to harness, well, you know, we did it. We started this, we piloted this game show called Tell Me Something I Don't Know, which is an, might be an offshoot of our radio show. And the way that we solicited people to be audience presenters for that was through the website. So I guess I just gave you a long answer that said no. The short answer is actually yes. We used it last <laughs> month. Um, so you know, it's what I like about technology. Technology to me is just a bunch of tools that you can use or ignore or abuse or exploit however you want. I get really just tickled when I see people having these big moral stances about how technology is inherently A or B, good or bad. It's like a knife, fire, the oldest tools of technology. You could say exactly the same things about them. You know, A knife, I can use it to kill my neighbor, or I can use it to you know, cut up food for her dinner if she's paralyzed. That's what tools are. <laughs> is that weird? I thought that was how I know. <laughs> oh, because you're thinking I stabbed her? Is that? <laughs> um, so yeah, so I, I love, uh, so I'll, I'll exploit whatever technology necessary. And as a reporter, journalist, writer, technology is such 
a huge uh, asset for me. Um, uh, I think I think your terrorist example, terrorist uh, insurance sales was was highlighted interesting tension between trying to do more experiments and um, being authentic and sort of you know not manipulating your customers as a company or not manipulating your employees mm. and actually getting good data because you don't want to bias your your samples or um, uh, responses. Um, you know, how do you think about resolving that tension um, in, in areas that are more broadly applicable? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, generally, uh, I would say I, but I think we err on the side of non-exploitive and total transparency. Um, yeah, I, I can't really think of an instance where we've really tried to trick, manipulate, deceive anyone, or encourage firms that we've talked to to do the same. Um, this was different because we're trying to catch people who are trying to blow people up. Of course. That, it's really as simple as that. Um, and I'd do it again if there were people who were even thinking about doing something half as bad. But unless it's, um, unless it's something as drastic as that, um, yeah, no. Uh, we, we really try to be transparent. You know, I don't do that much of the consulting with Levitt. He enjoys that much more than I. Um, but, you know... It's just kind of a personal philosophy, I think, for both of us that you feel better at the end of the day if your sincerity is real. There's a lot of people, you know, there's the old argument, if you can fake sincerity, then you really got it made, which I guess is probably true. But there's something that feels really good about doing what you believe in and believing in what you do. And, and kind of if you fail by doing it that way, it feels a lot better than succeeding. But again, it's easy for us to say that because we've succeeded. I mean, honestly, Look, I'm a writer who never thought I could afford to live in New York with a family as a writer, and I got really lucky and was successful enough with these books that I can live in New York and have a family. And that was a, a huge surprise and gift to me. So it's easy for me to now to say, well, I can spend a year on a project, and if like you know it doesn't work out, I can just drop it. That's a ridiculous luxury I have, and I know it. So I try to be aware of that when you're talking to firms or employees starting out, you know, it's easy to say, yeah, quit your job and follow your dream. You know, that's ridiculous advice in the real world. And we try to, <laughs> but to me, that's actually the more difficult balance than the one that you asked about is trying to give prescriptive advice that's generalizable and not just from our um, perspective. Um, I have a question. Uh, one of my favorite pieces uh, um, in Freakonomics was uh, why drug dealers still live there with, with their moms. Um, and I couldn't help but thinking that the economic basis was pretty sound, but there are other factors working as well, which like so, sorry, say that last part again. You couldn't help but thinking what the economic factors that you that you laid out, the tournament pay, that yeah. obviously you know works uh, helps decide uh, or describe a part of it. But then there are other factors working, like social, behavioral, and so on. So my question is like slightly in more broader terms. What do you think? Like how much of the world could be explained by economics, and how much of it is due to the other different factors? Yeah, uh, that's really, um, that, I hate to say, that's just the kind of question that I'm not good at. So I could, I could tell you a bunch of stories around it. Um, you know, I guess I think, I mean, I guess what I would say and answer the question is go read a bunch of Gary Becker. Because Gary Becker was the economist who um, changed the way that we think about incentives and intentionality and rationality and the idea that, I, and this was huge at the time. Now it doesn't seem revolutionary at all. But Gary Becker basically said, if you care enough about, let's say, criminal behavior to spend five minutes thinking about it, even five minutes, then you should care enough to not assume that people who do criminal behavior are doing it because they are so fundamentally different from you as a human being. You should instead think about what are the incentives that are presented to that person, what is their choice set, and, why did, what, and how do they gravitate toward the choice that they actually make. And by learning that, what can we learn about either helping people like that make different choices, or changing policy to encourage fewer of those choices, or maybe it's punish those choices more strongly. So that, to, he to me was like the framer. If there was, a, if there's like a constitution of free economics, Gary Becker was like all the founding fathers. He all, he, you know, and then there were other people that came along, and Levitt will be the first one to tell you that if it weren't for Gary Becker, 
a guy like Steve Levitt never would have been able to do the kind of research that he's done, the kind of topics that he's done. So Becker really was, and you know, Becker died just this, this past year. And um, I, I loved, he was a great, he was a great human um, as well as a great economist. He wasn't a great writer, unfortunately, Gary Becker. And there's no reason he should be. I mean, he's spending hours being a great economist. So if you go read his stuff, it, it, it's, um, it, some of it kind of needs you to transpose that kind of question on top of it. But it's really, really good. And um, even though he's kind of famous and he won a Nobel and when he died, he was in all the papers, I feel like his work is really not revered the way that it ought to be. And it contains, I think, almost everything that you know mm -hmm. that you or I would talk about in either psychology or economics. It's really there. So 38%. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Hi. Oh, you have a mic. Oh. Yeah. In one of your Freakonomics books, you discuss the finding that the way parents raise their children doesn't really affect the way the kids turn out. So this study seems like it'd be very hard for p loving parents to accept and live by. I was wondering if you've been able to regard the study when raising your own children. Yeah, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, maybe it, maybe it sounded like we said that parents don't matter or what parents do don't matter at all. But that's, that's not what we mean to say. What, what we meant to say there, it was honestly, it was very nuanced and narrow, and actually not all that helpful what we had to say. We were basically <laughs> saying that we were basically saying that a lot of the things that a lot of parents worry about the most are not that important, OK? So a lot of like culture cramming and things like that. But the kind of parent who is likely to culture cram, to take, make their kids go to museums and make them read books and make them take extra math class during the summer, it, it's, more of a, um, it's more of a selection bias issue than anything. Those parents are probably pretty smart to start with. So there's IQ, and that's a big part of how smart a person is. But then also, there is something said to be said for building an environment where education or attainment of knowledge or whatever you want to call it is incentivized and appreciated. And, that, and that's what I feel good parents do. We actually, our podcast last week was about um, teacher skill, generally. And we we're trying to look at just the relationship between, like, you know, US teachers are generally much less, do less well in college themselves than do teachers in a lot of other rich countries. So we're basically recruiting our public school teachers from the bottom half and sometimes even the bottom third where a lot of other rich countries are getting their teachers from the top quarter, maybe even higher. So we looked at that. The second half of that episode, which comes out, uh, I think, midnight tonight, is about this project in Toronto called Pathways to Education, which was an education reform project, but it wasn't even run by a school. It was run by a social services healthcare agency attached to a housing project. And basically what they did is they saw their high school dropout rate in Regent Park in Toronto was something ridiculous, 70 80%. And they basically went to try to figure this out. And they realized that the kids who were dropping out were dropping out for all kinds of reasons. Most of them getting back to the root cause was that their family environment was deeply not conducive to going to school. No one cared. No one made sure they were going to school or doing homework. There was often just one parent. Um, they weren't getting rewarded for doing well. They didn't talk about. The, and if you think about education as an investment, it's the most ridiculous investment to try to sell somebody on. You have to go to a four-year-old kid and say, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to a place that's not where you want to be right now, which is in your room playing. I want you to go to a place with a, a bunch of other kids that you don't like, like you, with a teacher that you're probably not going to like. And I want you to spend the next 12 or 16 or 20 years doing stuff that you mostly don't want to do so that when you're 22 or 25 years old, you'll have more options in life. As investments go, and we're not going to pay you a penny along the way. As investments go, that's a hard sell. But that's what modern parents do. That's what a modern education system does. But if you don't have someone selling you that, you start to look at it and say, yeah, you mean I could either like not go to school and hang out with my friends and smoke dope and have a lot of fun right now, or I could do the opposite of all those things and maybe be better off 10 years from now? No way. And you know, humans are, we're really big hyperbolic discount. We're terrible, terrible at that. What kind of four-year-old did you have? 
Really? Are yours better? Yours are better? Maybe it's the schools are the better. The dope part. Go I don't ahead. know. <laughs> oh, is that how it came out? <laughs> Let me say, this is why I'm a writer. I need to go back over what I said and see if it. <laughs> um, so what this pro project does, Pathways to Education, is it basically offers four different pillars of support for high school kids, financial, social, tutoring, and one more I can't remember. <laughs> but basically, when you look at it, it's am amazing. What it does is it basically acts, it basically does all the things that a family is supposed to do. And that's both. Great to know that it works, and it really, really, really works. It's also really depressing to know how many kids there are that come from families like that that really need that kind of support. So I don't mean to discount at all um, the power of a good family, um, but what I do need to, but what I do mean to do is um, try to use data where possible to show that a lot of things that modern helicopter parents especially worry about a lot are really, really, really on the margin and, and don't matter nearly as much as they think. Do we have time for one more question? Make it good, or at least not back. hard. <laughs> it shouldn't be too hard. Um, so it seems like a lot of authors fall into certain buckets, like a bucket of, I have an interesting framework that's potentially applicable to your life, or I have some insight on this topic that I'm expert on. For hey, you, sorry, can you hold the mic a little closer and start sure. where I really can't hear? Um, so I was just saying, in terms of authors, that are sort of two buckets I often see for popular writings. One's a framework that you can use in your life. Right. Another one is some insight about some particular topic. Right. Um, for you, it seems like you have a certain framework that unifies what you do. Yeah. And ultimately, you write about all those insights. Could you just talk a little bit about the framework and how you go out thinking about new topics as you continue to progress? Yeah, that, that's a real, I, I really appreciate that question because... Um, that's something that I think about a lot, but it's like, um, I guess like if I were to, to be someone who designed carburetors in cars, I wouldn't really be offended if people who drove my car didn't think about the carburetor and how great it is. And similarly, as a writer, like I think about that idea a lot, which is how to kind of hybridize the ideas and the stories and the framework and the narrative but I realize that's not when you're reading it, when you're consuming a book, you're not supposed to care about that, unless you're a writer and trying to look and see how it's done. Um, so I would say, in terms of how, uh, how that comes about, um, you know, I could take some credit, but I, I have to give Levitt a lot, a lot, a lot of credit. Um, he has a truly bizarre and original brain. And here's the best part. He doesn't care at all what comes out of his mouth, ever. And so that can be really bad if you're uh, in the wrong circumstance. But with me, and he's just talking kind of stream of consciousness when we, talk, when we just get on a topic, um, sometimes it'll, he'll talk for an hour, and, and it'll just be one thing that'll say. But there's a lot going on in his brain that has taught me to how to reframe and rethink things or to set up a framework or to enlarge in a framework. And so um, I guess what I'm really saying is I, I think that you know, of all the ways that I got really lucky as a writer, the, the biggest one was having a collaborator who's not only a genius but a creative genius. And so my advice to you would be find a creative genius and collaborate with that person. <laughs> um, <laughs> Failing that, you know, work hard, be honest, uh, pat your kids on the head, and don't screw up too much. But that's about all I got, really. So, all right. Thank you very much for having me today. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you.